Hello and welcome back to Mend with Mare. I'm so happy to have you here to talk about a topic that is near and dear to my heart and one that's a little tough to talk about, but one that I feel so passionate about. Today, we are going to talk about addiction, but this is specifically geared toward loved ones of addicts. I want to explain my use of the word addict. I'm only using this word just for brevity because it's simple and quick. Usually whenever I'm working in my practice and I would speak about someone who has an addiction as um, a loved one with addiction concerns. Why I say that is because it's identifying that this is a person who has addiction concerns, but it's not their whole identity. Sometimes we just say addict as if that just puts a blanket statement on them, that they're just an addict as if that means... I've heard some pretty horrible things. I've heard people call other junkies and druggies, and if you ever say that in front of me, you will not be met with much warmth. Um, but that's because I find it offensive, those type of words. So when I say addict, I'm not saying it at all in a derogatory way. I'm saying it because it's simpler and because I am talking about a wide range of addictions and that can be anything from gambling to just shopping to eating to drugs and alcohol. You know, there are a lot of things that you can be addicted to. So I want to speak to all of the loved ones of addicts and give you a space to feel seen and supported. I think that oftentimes all the focus tends to go on the person with the addiction. Not enough focus is on the people that are suffering peripherally because they are being affected by the actions and by the addiction. Sometimes we can't help but be collateral damage. For this moment to be transparent and lift the veneer of professionalism, I know what it's like to be collateral damage to a loved one's addiction and it's really, really bleeping hard. I think that it's important to talk about it. And look, I wish that being an expert in this field and in this area in substance abuse would make me exempt from this experience that somehow I could save my loved ones from addiction and that it can magically be solved. But it, it isn't because addiction, it's universal. It doesn't, it doesn't care about your job title. Wish it did. It doesn't care about your gender or your socioeconomic status. It doesn't care about any of those things. So I have five stages that I have come up with myself that I believe really do encompass kind of a, the arc that you might go through as a loved one of an addict. And the first stage is when you're just kind of curious, like you just have that a little like, that was weird, you know, like a little pang of curiosity. Like, hmm, I thought I had, I thought I had more pills in my, in my pill box. No, they wouldn't have taken it. Or looking at your loved one, noticing that maybe when they drink, they drink a little too much. Or you're at a point where you don't feel worried or concerned enough to confront them about it. You think that maybe you're just, you're just imagining this or maybe you're just being overly sensitive to their use or their behaviors. Just noticing little like subtle changes that might be going on and little things that might not add up necessarily and you're really not sure whether you should bring it up or not. It's just a little like, hmm, I gotta keep my eye on that. It's that stage. So the next stage that loved ones of addicts might find themselves in is the one where you know it's a problem, but you don't quite know what to do about it. You feel really helpless. I mean, you're probably gonna feel that way the whole entire time, but you really wanna save them. And you're delusional enough at this point that you think that you can, and you think it's gonna pass if you address it right away, or maybe you don't, and you might find yourself wanting to protect them and wanting to keep it quiet for them because if, if nobody knows, maybe we'll get through this and not everybody will find out and, 
and all will be well. But you really do you want to save them. You want to help them through it. And even some people in your life might have noticed a little change in you, yourself. Your behavior might change a little bit. But you are keeping a, a good face on so that nobody, you know, will know. I'm going to keep this quiet, keep it under wraps for, for the addict because at that point we care so much about protecting them than getting support for ourselves. So a lot of times that's where we start to go wrong. And that's not an accusatory way. I totally understand it. You're very hopeful and you want to keep it kind of a secret for them. And you don't want to out someone who's dealing with something that's really, really hard. The next stage is when you love an addict and you're just so confused. You keep trying to anticipate their reactions and their needs you start to step in wherever you can so that you can protect them from any type of consequences of their behaviors. Unfortunately, you're realizing that they're not stopping. Even though you are doing all of these things to try to protect them, while you are probably getting very good at maneuvering around their volatility, you will find that you just cannot study the waters like you used to. And then you start to go in and out of questioning your own sanity. You might spend hours just completely anxiety ridden or crying your eyes out just just so confused about like why is this person doing this why why are they messing up their lives why are they being destructive and you think that if you do things that will help them I somehow solve the problem and it's so frustrating sneaking down and finding where they hide their liquor bottle and pouring out a certain amount and then filling up the liquor bottle back up with a certain amount of water so that they don't notice that you're watering it down so that maybe they won't get as drunk. So you're trying to save them from it or keeping track of how many drinks that they have. And you might find yourself doing things you never thought that you would like they're super hungover or messed up so that they don't lose their job because you have bills to pay, you have children to take care of. You will maybe call their boss and, and, lie for them and say, you know, that they had food poisoning. You could end up paying off a loan that they took out to support their habit just so that they don't get charged the interest on it and that you're wanting to keep them from these like major consequences. Or you might be very, very tired and you still get yourself up and go and pick them up from the bar because you're afraid that they'll drive home drunk and you want to make sure that they're protected. But all that it's teaching them is that you will save them from their consequences and that you will step in and keep them protected. And it, it doesn't create a very good dynamic because addicts, as much as they do want you and they need you, um, they also don't want you to be too much like an authoritarian or like a mother or hovering, doing any of those type of things. So it gets really, really confusing. And you might find yourself even staying outside of somebody's house to make see what time they're gonna be leaving. What they're doing there, could they possibly be buying drugs? Are they not? Maybe you'll find yourself looking at their emails and trying to see if they've done excessive spending, but you'll feel very confused because they will likely be defensive. They probably don't see it as a as a problem yet and they probably don't want to change either and for you it'll be almost maddening because you're like why do you want to keep living this way or just it's starting to be prioritized over the things that used to be important in your life together and it also is really confusing your loved one might start behaving in ways that you never saw coming or never expected they're going to be a sweet gentle kind person who turns into like a very emboldened, argumentative, somewhat more narcissistic, and just doing things that they never would have done before. It's almost like you get whiplash from the change that goes on with them. And then it's even more confusing. If they do get better for a little bit, you're like, oh my gosh, it's gonna be okay, yes. And then it's not. So this is a stage that I, see so many people come to therapy in like they come to therapy finally in this stage because they're just so exhausted and distraught want to help their loved one of course they want to help them they love them to death but they might be really hurting themselves trying to help them i've 
you know, met with so many people who their own jobs suffered because they were spending so much time consumed in their loved one's addiction and trying to help them with it, that they weren't taking care of themselves. And that's why I really do emphasize self-care for a lot of people who love an addict because it is, it is brutal because you will sacrifice everything. You'll sacrifice your, your time, your sleep, your money, because you're really afraid. And rightfully so. You're afraid that this is going to continue on and something bad will happen. It keeps you engaged in this cycle. And it's keeping the addict from having to face you know, what their behaviors are really doing. Remember, these stages are a little linear. You might go back and forth through them, but the fourth stage that I usually see and have experienced (laughs) is you love an addict and damn it, they are going to change if it's the last thing you do. It is your mission. Before, you just felt kind of confused and you were trying and now you're like, I am going to do everything to make this stop and to make them see and understand that they are harming themselves. This can look like crying and pleading and yelling and screaming and acting out in ways that you never thought you would act toward another human being. I mean, I know for myself in reaction to the insanity that is addiction, I would say things that I I just, I couldn't even believe that I muttered them because it just was so hard to get the other person to understand how they were harming themselves. And so it was almost like venomous. It was very unattractive and made me feel very ugly and, and ashamed of myself. But the one good thing about this stage is that you don't care anymore. You don't care who knows. You're not gonna protect them. You just, they need to get help. You will call anybody and everyone enlisting people to try to get them around your loved one, your addict, to to make them see that they have got to get better. You are wanting them to take it as seriously as you are. And unfortunately, that might not happen. It could happen. It might not ever happen. That's really frustrating. But all of your focus in this stage is on them, like on a mission. You're bound and determined to make them stop. Also, you're maddened by it. You're, you're exhausted over this. You might start to think like, I can't keep living this way. This is torture because you start to walk on eggshells and whenever you're paying attention to everything that somebody else is doing and trying to also play chess. I am definitely a big like chess player. I felt, (laughs) I felt like with the people in my life that I've loved that have had addiction issues. You don't want to have to think about like three moves ahead about like, well, if, if this gets worse, then they might lose their job. Then they might have to do this. And then they need to go to rehab now. And you're just, you're just hyping yourself up and you're just consumed by it. And you are just so frustrated and you want this over with because you're realizing, holy shit, this addiction has taken over not just my life, all kinds of people's lives. And the effects are so obvious and evident to everyone else but the addict. And and you're exhausted trying. And then the fifth and final stage is when you love someone and you are defeated. You are truly defeated. This is when you are just waving your white flag of surrender. Like, I don't know. I give up. You can't handle this anymore. You're realizing that it is affecting you in a very negative way and that you might feel just emotionally destroyed. You might feel beaten up. You might feel like you have gotten hit by a truck. It might be hard to get out of bed because you're no longer in denial. You're no longer in fight or flight mode. You are realizing that there's really nothing that you can do and that you have no control over another person's choices. And that it's also not your responsibility, but it's going to be really, really hard to let go of that. You might be judging yourself like, how did I get here? How, how did I not see the signs? I didn't see it soon enough. I should have done this. If I would have done that, feel like helpless and your heart is breaking. But this time your heart's not just breaking for the addict. Your heart is breaking for yourself because you realize that you have worn yourself out. You have betrayed yourself in some ways, letting this addiction take over your life. 
and putting someone else's life and needs before yours and not allowing people to face the consequences of their actions. Some people never get to this point, but it's really healthy if you can. But I know that it's so hard once you get there. What just happened to my life? No matter what stage you are in, please know that you're not alone. And I also want to say that I know you don't know me necessarily. Some of you do. But any part of this video resonated with you, please know that I, I love you and I'm sorry. I know that sorry doesn't make it better. But, but I truly am sorry that you've had to go through this experience because loving an addict truly is one of the most painful things that anyone can go through. And please excuse this. Huh. And know that I'm, I'm sending you good vibes, good healing vibes, and know that you're not alone. And that I want to build a community here for you all. So take care. I'm honored to be with you. Please subscribe and have a good day.